these digital spaces might in some ways powerfully influence the ways that people settle both here and there. Um, and so what I'm, oh, that's not advancing. Oh, there we go. Um, so what I'm wanting to do is um, in 35, 40 minutes is just provide sort of an overall context, which I think many of you might be familiar with in terms of forced migration, to engage with these concepts of settlement, resettlement, to then look at the ways that, um, that the durable solutions for refugees might relate to transnationalism, to then I'll make the argument that we need to think about settlement in increasingly transnational ways, uh, and to think about the intersections of social media within that. So that's kind of the plan. So I think probably some of these numbers that you'll be fairly familiar with, but the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yep, okay. Uh, notice that there's unprecedented levels of forced migrants since World War II, so it's an increase of 300,000 from last year, nearly 66 million people, um, and that uh, a total of 22.5 million refugees, so um, that's an increase increase of sort of 65% from just five years ago. Um, and that uh, about 190,000 people over 2016 were resettled in, in what they call a third country, which is places like the United States, Canada, the UK, uh, Scandinavian countries, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, those numbers will be significantly less for this year because of the US's um, temporary ban, uh, ban on, on, on taking new refugees and it's and what what's looking like will be a drastically reduced commitment that the U.S. takes. Um, I just want to highlight there that of that 65 million, that, that 40 million of them are internally displaced people. And so oftentimes when we talk about refugees, the, what is referred to as IDPs or internally displaced people are oftentimes forgotten about when they're actually the largest majority of people who are forcibly displaced. And that to be a refugee, you have to have a well-founded fear of persecution and owing to that well-founded fear, um, uh, uh, you you um, you, le you leave your, your home country until you leave your you cross that international border. You're an internally displaced person, and then owing to that well-founded fear, you're unable to return. So that's sort of some of the key criteria for being a refugee. I think it's just important that we keep that in mind when we're talking about refugees and forced migration, because oftentimes the IDPs are the ones that are that are forgotten about. Um, and so this is a uh, a report from the UNHCR at the start of this year, which is entitled connecting refugees. And what you can see in those colored dots there are um, the levels of connectivity in, in type of displacement. So the green and blue dots represent uh, 2G and 3G coverage. So if people have like a mobile phone, they're, they're able to connect in certain ways. The red dots say that there's no coverage. So those are more places, there's, a, there's some places sort of on the sort of the Thai, uh, Thai Burma border, South Sudan in particular. Where, where that coverage isn't really provided. And then you can see that those countries that are shaded in black, which are predominantly countries of resettlement, these, these are places where there's also that connectivity. And so it really sort of highlights this thing as sort of dislocation in an age of connection and the ways that increasingly people are able to connect with people with places proximate and distant in quite powerful ways. And that the usability, the availability, the accessibility of these technologies, the infrastructure, is, is improving and it does allow people to access people across the seas, though in uneven ways. Um, and so I think some of the things that we need to think about in terms of the current state of play, this is just a, a, one of the keynote addresses from the World Refugee Summit in 2016. Um, and so you can sort of see some of the dominant things that, that were being spoken about there. And really the, the purpose of that World Refugee Summit, which developed the New York Declaration, really spoke about the need for um, for settlement states in particular to play a greater role in trying to find um, durable and, and lasting solutions for refugees, both in terms of resettlement, but also in, in terms of other durable solutions, which I'll come to. And it sort of really highlights some of the debates that have really um, that have played out here in New Zealand, Australia, France, Germany, around their approach to refugees and, and how they deal with forced migration. So that debate about welcome versus deterrence, you know. Do we have welcoming policies for refugees that, that sort of, you know, that, that acknowledge their situation? Or should we actually try to deter them? Should we try to emphasize the importance of local solutions? Um, or if we actually have too much, if, if our policies are, are too welcoming, does this open, sometimes what they say, the, the floodgates? And obviously those are inappropriate metaphors to talk about people. That's, that's, that's the discourse. The debates about autonomy and assistance, how much, 
how much help do we provide to refugees um, versus um, how much self-determination should, would we, should we be encouraging them to actually sort of take and sort of, um, you know, think about those different forms of, and levels of assistance. And Barbara Harrell Bond, who sort of really developed the field of refugee studies, wrote that groundbreaking uh, book in, I think, 1986, which was entitled Imposing Aid, which the title even sort of highlights some of those complexities around how do we, how do we support people in, in, in uh, certain situations. The commitment and compliance, sort of the how, when, where, and why of uh, when states sort of adhere to their international obligations and when they uh, transgress them. We have to look at Australia and its, uh, its uh, policies of uh, offshore processing of indefinite detention. I think someone died uh, on Papua New Guinea just yesterday um, in one of those processing centers. So lo lo looking at some of these international obligations and when states adhere to them or not. And to really think about that vulnerability and capacity debate, that oftentimes we understand refugees within a vulnerability lens, and that's important, but that we also have to think about the capacities that they also bring. Um, so I think some of that will come up, but I, you know, we sort of think about that alongside uh, other contexts. And so this is sort of Trump's um, uh, um, inaugural speech about migration. And you can see, again, um, just some of the different ways that, that, that that migration displacement is being talked, spoken about, and how that sort of informs the discourse. And as the Thomas theorem suggests, that you know, um, uh, things that are that are actually perceived as risky or um, or dangerous are actually dangerous in its its, its actual outcomes. Um, so, um, the words resettlement and settlement are oftentimes used interchangeably within the forced migration literature. And I think that we need to think, I think it's important to actually distinguish these things. So for me, um, refugee resettlement is largely about protection. It's about addressing those well-founded fears for persecution and it's trying to protect those people from that. So when, when New Zealand or Australia or other countries say we'll resettle people, it's about protecting them from that well-founded fear. Refugee settlement, when someone, when people actually arrive, it's no longer so much about protection. They actually, you know, New Zealand, they're automatically permanent residents. So it's no longer about sort of protection. It's actually more about belonging. And I think that increasingly, we have to think about refugee settlement within a transnational frame. And so to think about the ways that uh, refugee settlement isn't just about being here, it's about them being here and there and how that we can think about settlement as ongoing transnational experience, which I think has significant implications for the ways that we think that we resource uh, and, and respond to forced migration, that we even the ways we even think about settlement programs and policies. So just very quickly, and I mean, I imagine a number of you know this, but that the UNHCR notes that there are sort of three main durable solutions for refugees. The first being voluntary repatriation and represents the, the largest Durable solution for refugees, which means that people are able to return home once the conflicts have subsided, that well founded fear of persecution has diminished or isn't there anymore. So, examples of that are places in Afghanistan, Ivory Coast, Mali, the Balkan states. Um, but for many people, that, that isn't the case. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there are, I think there are 32 protracted refugee situations around the world at the moment, which is defined as more than 25,000 people. Um, from one particular country of origin that are, are forcibly displaced for more than five years. And that occurs across 27 different countries. So another solution is local integration, which is difficult to quantify and to measure, but really it's about usually where people go to a, to a neighboring country of asylum and they, they integrate locally. So examples of that might be uh, uh, Burmese people that have made it into, into Thailand. There's more than 2 million Burmese people that live in Bangkok. Now, all of them would be forcibly displaced, but a lot of them would, would, uh, would uh, have, have, have been, and they, they live everyday lives in, in Bangkok, or um, South Sudanese people living in Kampala and Uganda, um, a number of Syrians, Iraqis that have make their way into, into Lebanon. One in five people from Lebanon are from a refugee background. And then finally, there, there, there's resettlement, and that's really what uh, my study is, is, is focusing on, which is a transfer from a country of asylum to, to another state that provides a permanent residence or a pathway to it. That within all of these, uh, the UNHCR talks about the way to think about the context, that there needs to be sort of legal, economic, cultural, political, and civil considerations that make any of these durable solutions comprehensive. And that I think increasingly, 
when we think about that comprehensive solution, we have to think about it as it relates to transnationals. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm going to go and think about the digital within that. So if we just look at transnationalism, Nicholas von here, Katie Long, others have actually spoken about transnationalism, not as a durable solution, but as an enduring solution through a migration and mobility approach. Um, and if we just sort of look at transnationalism, it's quite distinct from internationalism. You know, the word inter means between, so it suggests sort of the relationship between two states. Borders are very powerful within that, 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 that focus. Whereas trans sort of suggests almost sort of a notion of sort of transgressing, going beyond, where maybe traversing borders where they aren't as, as, as quite as powerful. So um, a number of you, for instance, could be, um, could be zooming in in Canada, uh, the United States, and Europe, somewhere in South Africa or wherever, and it wouldn't really matter too much which country you were from. You would, you'd be able to beam into this, into, this, into this presentation. So in that way, borders actually have less relevance than, than they do in, in other circumstances. Same thing can be said for Facebook or Viber or WhatsApp and those sorts of things. And so why this is important is that, is that all too often when we think about refugee settlement is that it's got a very state-centric focus. You know, how do we work with people here and not think about how do we work with people here and there. Um, and that even from a research standpoint, it's been critiqued as methodological nationalism, that all too often we focus on research that sort of sits within particularly defined, neatly defined borders and, and, and areas. And so, um, uh, you know, there's a number of people who have written about uh, transnationalism and the ways that people um, stay connected with um, people in, in various different locations. And they really talk about sort of, you know, the ways that this can be done through physical mobilities and travel, where people actually move. Um, it can be done through remittances, and that isn't just financial flows. Uh, Peggy Levitt has written a lot about this and sort of talking about the, you know, one of the sort of the uh, uh, widely acclaimed book, The Transnational Villager, that looks at sort of the, the cultural, social, um, uh, relational flows that, that occur between people here and there. There are different visas, permanent residence, sort of different sort of technologies that allow people to be mobile. There's, there's diasporic communities. And then finally, there are, these, there are these digital technologies that again, allow people to be transnational in ways that weren't pro pro probably even imagined um, um, 15 years ago. And, and increasingly, sort of new, new ways that people are able to be together um, through different social media platforms is, 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 is proliferating. Um, and so if we sort of look at some of the ones that, um, you know, some of the participants, you know, the, the, the uh, predominant social media platforms that they're using, you know, uh, some of them using, uh, you know, Viber, which is uh, allows people to do sort of free phone calls uh, or video chats, Instagram, sharing different pictures, text-based communications, YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat allows you to sort of share pictures, but the pictures delete them, or videos delete themselves after a certain amount of time, WhatsApp, Weibo, I'm a, the list goes on and on. And so um, I was really, and so what really sort of interests me in, in sort of the ways that refugees practice transnational family through social media was really when I was doing some work in uh, Canterbury around the, around the earthquakes that had occurred. And a woman uh, went into her house and she actually just had her Skype, her Skype on and she was just beaming in Afghanistan, not necessarily to speak to someone in Afghanistan, but it actually was almost like another space in her house. She had created another living room. It was part of her everyday life. Um, it wasn't something that was sort of, I'm going to speak to these people now. It was almost like her, like her family's watching her everyday life and she could do the same. And so I was really interested on these, this, these levels of what might, which was really like quite intimate forms of connection. Um, and provided that there was connectivity and they had the technology to do that and, and the, and the resources to, to sustain that, um, how people can stay here and there simultaneously. Um, and so, um, and, and part of this also even refer, relates to some of the work that I've done with, with Francis around sort of um, uh, uh, um, students uh, from minority backgrounds that, that, are, that are at university, and how they, how they use social media. And we looked at this, this notion of sort of a culture of connectivity, which uh, Josie Van Dyke wrote a, a book on, under under that title, and the thesis of of her of that book was really that we we have shifted from participatory cultures around how we use social media, 
where we choose to engage or not, to actually a culture of connectivity. And I would even guess that maybe in some of you all, you've been listening to me talk, maybe you've even grabbed your phone to check to see if you've got a WhatsApp or your Facebook feed has, has come in. And I even think that for some of you, you've done that and you don't even know it. <laughs> um, and because of that, because we've, because we've shifted from participatory cultures to a culture of connectivity, it's ingrained, it's interwoven into the everyday, into everything that we do. Um, so much to the point that we don't even critique it or engage with it. Um, but this has very real implications for the ways that we are social. And so as Van Dyke notes, that actually influences the nature of our social connections, its creation, interactions, and structure in quite powerful ways. And that from this, it actually sort of derives continuous pressure to sort of engage and um, uh, from the, both the peers and the technology themselves. And uh, uh, Castells has spoken about this as sort of a platform sociality where basically, um, you know, when we start engaging on some of these social media platforms, it's not about whether we choose to engage or not. It's almost like if you step off that platform, you cease being social. So this idea of sort of a voluntary choice, participatory cultures, is more flown into sort of this culture of connectivity. And that according to her, this means a resetting and unsettling of boundaries between private, corporate, and public domains. And I would even extend that within this study that it's also sort of unsettling these boundaries between borders and the ways that we even sort of think about sort of these neat and tidy borders between different states. And so, whoa, what just happened there? What did I do? Oh, I clicked on something wrong. Share screen? Yeah, share screen. Sorry. I must uh, find my place. Ah, here we go. My apologies. Um, so really, there's this transition from participatory culture to culture connectivity, if you accept Van Dyke's thesis. And I think, I think in many ways that that's powerfully evidenced. And really the normalization of this process, even as I was coming to this, um, uh, to this presentation, I, I, I had to get into three different, I got into two different elevators, and every time people were just buried into their phones. And that was, you know, that's completely acceptable. You don't have to acknowledge it. You're just, you're just, you know, that's normal. Um, and so that this greater connectivity doesn't necessarily mean greater connection, but I think in many ways it can. And so my study is really trying to understand that for refugees in that transnational space, but also in terms of what it means for people's commitments to local places. If we can have, if we can bring Afghanistan to New Zealand or Bogota to New Zealand, um, um, you know, we can have quite intimate discussions about politics, everyday life, sport, remembering, culture, food, um, we, we, we can participate in funerals, uh, weddings, all sorts of different things. What does that mean for our commitments to local places? And the dominant discourse or the thing that states are most interested in talking about as it relates to refugees is, is integration, right? And what does this mean for integration? So, um, so this is me in the middle. I'm the principal investigator. So this is through, through, through the, through, so it's a Marsden project. And I'm working with a number of people from refugee backgrounds who are engaging with their transnational family and friends. And I'm really trying to see sort of um, that relationship between the transnational domain and New Zealand. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm working with them over, um, over 10 months. Um, and I, I usually got them to do a, a questionnaire. I'll, I'll get them to do one more at the end around their perceived use of social media, who they're engaging with on what platforms through what forms of technology. They're doing weekly social media diaries, so I have 400, maybe 500 social media diaries that I'm currently analyzing, and I'm conducting multiple interviews with them over the 10 months. So quite sort of intensive, uh, rich data uh, that I'm um, collecting there. And I just want to sort of talk, I sort of want to walk you through some of that fairly quickly to then think about um, some of the implications for all of this. Um, Kate, are you off? I can't hear you, but um... I said, I'm sorry, I do have to leave now. It's really fascinating work, Jay, and I'll follow the video when I work out how to access it. <laughs> oh. um, I'm finished, but sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Thank you. See you I'll, later. I'll be in Wellington next week. Oh. So drop me a line. <laughs> Definitely, I will. Definitely. Okay. Hopefully, see you then. Bye.
Um, so just, I mean, in terms of how often do you share the following devices, what you can see here, you can't see that the number, but um, uh, all 15 participants have said they use the smartphone more than once a day. Um, a laptop would, would next be the most common, but um, uh, really, um, again, it sort of shows just how sort of mobile is the mobile technologies around the smartphone. Nothing really surprising there. This is how, how many total hours people estimate that they spend uh, on social media sites each day. Um, it's actually eventuated that through my interviews with them and the social media diaries, I think it's actually more than this for a number of them. But you can see that most of them are talking about two to three hours a day. But some of my participants that I'm working with, um, uh, six to eight hours every day. Which again, I think raises those interesting questions around opportunities to engage in local life if you have these sorts of commitments. Um, and then just sort of polymedia. So uh, there's a great book written by Miller and Madano that uh, is a book called po titled Polymedia, which looks at sort of how Filipino women use different forms of, of, of social media. But basically the idea is that, is that people are digitally discerning. They use different forms of, of, of media depending on sort of the levels and the types of interactions they want to have. And what this just sort of highlights is that almost everyone's using Facebook daily. Um, uh, Fiber and WhatsApp are very common, sort of as everyday um, uh, platforms. Skype isn't nearly as, as common, but people are using that more sort of maybe one to three times a, a month, or um, which they might just sort of be connecting with people uh, through video chat. Um, um, but this isn't sort of like a daily thing. It's, it's probably a more, more intense type of interaction. Some of this is synchronous, some of this is asynchronous, meaning that it, that it occurs not in real time. This would be a synchronous interaction. Um, Kate connecting through tomorrow will be an asynchronous one. Um, so I just want to walk you through just some of the uh, some of the the statements that some of the participants made in the social media diaries. And so this is one one participant who, uh, when she wakes up in the morning, she said that she has about two hundred WhatsApp messages on her phone. And um, so, she, but she talks about sort of this is sort of one hour everyday life. So first she connects through to Kenya. Um, to try to talk to her godson. Godson's not there, but they're actually able to share videos of the godson. And this is sort of a sort of, you know, connects her with, with, with important family. She then goes to Belgium and, and the UK with several different people and form a, form a group through a video chat where they um, talk about sort of older cousins that she hasn't seen for 20 years um, and talk about how much they've grown. And then she connects to the Netherlands to talk about workplace stresses that she has here in New Zealand and trying to get support transnational. Everyday life. Um, another participant, um, you know, uh, for her, it's about sort of remembering and connecting to culture, and even sort of trying to memorialize and recognize uh, relatives that have died. Um, she connects through with her grandmother, and they cook together, and then she shares that food with uh, her New Zealand flatmates that she lives with. And so it's a way of sort of connect, connects here and there, and also provides context for her to engage with, with people within New Zealand. Um, other participants have very overt political agendas. I found that, either, that for the most part, they're either very political or else they avoid it at all costs. And for some people, that's for very real reasons, for safety. And it has actually had some interesting methodological and ethical implications for that sort of work. Um, but um, you know, uh, there are some participants that are from South Sudan that are advising communities on how to stay safe, that they're, they're corroborating information and talking with the student, South Sudanese diaspora Canada, the United States, and the UK, and Australia, and connecting to, um, uh, when possible, with South Sudan to, to have debates. Uh, the South Sudanese community has been referred to as internet warriors, um, and in some ways it's being accused of sort of fanning the flames of ethnic tensions that has sort of made this conflict worse. But other, some of the participants that I've worked with spoke about their commitments to peace building and, and even sort of moderate WhatsApp groups and stuff like that too to try to actually sort of reduce those tensions and promote understanding. And so what's really uh, interesting about that, whether you know, it's South Sudan or Syria or, or elsewhere, is just you know, for some of them, um, having encrypted forms of communication is really important, so things like WhatsApp or Telegram so that their, their communications are safe. Uh, for other people, it's, it's about trying to, to make it as, as wide as possible, have that interaction. And for others, the, the risk of surveillance is such that um, I couldn't even, some participants won't even allow me in the recording of the data to say what country they're from. Um, 
And for some of them during the study, they've actually lost contact with friends and family, and even the things that they're allowed to say are so limited because of this risk of surveillance. So who's watching them for what reasons and for what, and what possible consequences? Um, and so they're digitally discerning. One in terms of, it could even just be that some of the platforms, some of them are more stable at different, con different times. The, some of them take a greater bandwidth to, in order to sort of communicate. But for some, but in some ways, though, it goes back to the idea of platform sociality. They can really only engage on the platforms that other people are engaged. And so if they do try to move to a new one, so Telegram is a relatively new platform, um, uh, how is it that they can get the, their networks onto that? And so there's, there's sort of this, um, this, this tension between maybe what might be the best platform to operate on versus which platforms people exist and reside in. And I think probably most importantly, and I think this is where I think that we think about trans, uh, settlement as an ongoing transnational experience, is these are some of the interviews that I've conducted with different participants. And you can just sort of see there, social media is a basic need of everyday life. Um, we grow when we are in connection, support each other. Half of me is social media. Um, you know, something's missing from my life if I don't have my phone. And you can even look at sort of the pictures of people that are making their way into Europe and the number of pictures you see people with sort of smartphones and trying to get them plugged in and that sort of thing. Um, and so it's really clear, you know, that um, for these participants, that if they weren't connected, um, this, this would have severe consequences for them. In fact, um, the, the way I'm approaching this data is through, is through a, a constructivist form of grounded theory, and so I'm able to sort of follow the data. And so over time, I, I, I start asking questions. One of my questions is, um, uh, so if, if, if I could give you a five-day holiday anywhere in New Zealand, you go anywhere you like, the only implication is that you couldn't take your phone with you, would you go? And most of my participants have said no. So just to show you how important it is to have that level of connection in an ongoing way. For some of them, it's, it's, it's daily. If they, don't, if they don't have that connection daily, it's highly anxiety-inducing. And so this relates to that popular internet meme where they take sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you know, clearly you know, Wi-Fi is placed at the base. And well, that's sort of meant to be sort of you know, humorous in a way, but I actually think it's, it's, it's deadly serious. Um, and I mean, we, we can even look at some of the disaster literature here around, even in Auckland, a uh, survey was done around how people um, you know, what, what it is that they would want following a disaster. And the first thing that they talk about is getting reconnected. So it's clear that these remittance flows provide a real resource and a form of support uh, in terms of identity, in terms of belonging, of connecting their kids to culture, those sorts of things. You know, they're, they're very clear about it. But it's also an obligation. A lot of participants have spoken about how they receive requests for funding, sometimes for, for family that they didn't even know existed. Um, that some of them are involved in, um, uh, you know, supporting uh, friends and family making their way into, into Europe. Um, some of them also receive support from, from friends and family. And so there's, there's also an obligation within this as well. Um, and so I think that, you know, we have to think about sort of the ways that people provide transnational settlement support and the way that transnational Settlement is, is, is about belonging and how transnational relationships can inculcate belonging. And so, you know, one person sort of said, you know, in social media diaries again, these interactions made me feel connected and warm. And almost sort of, but they said, you know, I, sharing these things rather than meeting people and talking law. And so, whilst that sort of sounds, you know, that feel connected and warm is great, but may I think about those implications, but if they're not meeting people live, what does that mean possibly in a New Zealand context? But then other people say that this actually gives them confidence to actually engage in New Zealand life, to engage in employment, uh, to engage in these everyday activities that are often sort of benchmarked as forms of integration that relate to language acquisition, um, education, employment, and, um, participating in civil society, those sorts of things. And that the digital media provides these, 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 these forms, these sort of economic, relational flows in, 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 in everyday events, but also major events. So the nice thing about this study being over 10 months is that I've captured things such as the Kaikoura earthquakes, the election of Donald Trump, um, uh, uh, um, maybe like major events. So, you know, even, even what's happening at the moment in, in, in Myanmar, Burma, I'm, I'm, I'm able to talk to people and say, what's going on in there? How are you engaging in these debates? 
what's happening in South Sudan? Can you, you know, and so, so trying to follow follow those those, those, those different things has, has, has been been really interesting. As friends or family make their way on to 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 Europe in different places, or they get to Germany and getting that support, there's maybe maybe there's a terror attack in France, and they've got friends and family that are there. How are they supporting them in those ways? And their everyday settlement in France. So I think what this 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 raises questions. Raylene Wilding has written a lot about this sort of stuff around sort of co-presence, sort of blurring those boundaries of sort of what constitutes real interactions. For many people, that digital space is far more real than face to face. It's more intimate, it's more genuine, it's more authentic than face to face interactions. And even the ways that you know, sort of the ways that um, uh, you know, people can participate in everyday lives elsewhere. This idea sort of the phone is passing through different hands. Um, um, you know, I don't turn my phone off. Some people, some of my participants actually sleep with the phone next to them. Some of them don't even turn off the alerts because it's so important that, that they're part of that everyday life. But that also raises questions for, are you getting enough sleep to, <laughs> in the first place? Um, it's kind of like they are here. So I've spoken a lot about sort of refugees. Um, and, but I think the, the other part of the, of, of the equation that we really need to think about is sort of, you know, this sort of, you know, this notion of crisis and the moniker of crisis and the lexicon of terror and how that's used in ways that sort of justify um, uh, certain policies that relate to sort of forced migration, refugees, and that sort of thing. And I'm not trying to say that, uh, and I think that we really need to, crit to critically engage with this notion of crisis. I think there's no doubt that for the Greek island of Lesbos, it's, it's a crisis where hundreds of thousands of forced migrants have arrived on, onto their shores or, you know, Turkey has received, um, I think sort of two million refugees just over the last few years. Um, but you know, we talk about sort of um, you know Australia's situation with asylum seekers, or even sort of New Zealand's amendment to how they would deal with a, a boat, even though a boat's never arrived under its own steam to New Zealand's shores, really sort of raises the question around how crisis might be used in certain ways to sort of leverage a populist agenda and to legitimate policy directions that actually aren't even based in evidence or uh, those sorts of things. Australia's sort of approach to asylum seekers is, is certainly a race to legislate to the bottom. Um, and, you know, we can even look at the ways that social media is used to convey this. And so this is during the Trump camp, this is during the presidential campaign, and this is Donald Trump Jr. And what he's basically saying is that, uh, that the refugee resettlement program is dangerous and that, you know, our Syrian refugee problem, if only three of these skills were poisonous, would you eat them? So he's trying to sort of relate refugees to a bowl of Skittles and, Obviously, that's inappropriate in and of itself. But um, you know, the problem with this is that is that this then be, is, is conveyed as fact within the the, the wider society. Um, and you know, a number of people actually went and debunked that, and actually said, well, actually, to make this representative of, of the real fact, you'd actually need three Olympic-sized swimming pools filled with skittles to get to one poisonous skittle, or eat about a hundred skittles a minute for 130 years. So you know, those are those are risks. Those are chances that I'd rather take. In fact. If we're worried about sort of people being safe, maybe we should look at the U.S.'s gun control laws before we think about refugees, right? But anyway, that's a conversation for another time. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this relates to sort of that moral panic. And so, um, I've written about this a bit around sort of how refugees and asylum seekers have shifted in sort of the, the wider society, the policy domain, government, uh, politician imaginations from them being at risk to a risk. And in that shift. It actually legitimates all sorts of decisions that we, we can make and common perceptions that we have about refugees. That allows us to sort of securitize and externalize our borders. That allows us to actually focus on building walls rather than fostering a will. So, you know, one of those questions that I have in this study is social media diversity, social cohesion within New Zealand. Does it enhance it? Does it threaten it? Does it do a bit of both? And I think really, I mean, uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be one answer. It's, it's probably all of the above in, in many ways in different contexts. But I think that increasingly we have to think about how these forms of connection actually relate to an enduring solution for refugees. Less than 1% of the world's refugees will be resettled in places like New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. So what are the ways that we can connect that 1% to the 99? And how do we think about settlement as an ongoing transnational experience? And how do we resource it as such? 
So it allows us to shift from just thinking about one-way integration, which is how do refugees integrate into our society, to shift into a two-way integration, which isn't done all that well, which is thinking about how refugees integrate into our society, but how, do, how does society come and meet them as well, to actually thinking about, well, how actually how is it that integration is also a transnational experience? But look, um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities around different forms of social media. The, the one at the top there, uh, the Ushahidi, is a disaster sort of crowdsourced map that people can, can populate so they could say, this is where you get food and water, this is hospitals that are open, this is, this is where power exists, this is where a militia is moving in or whatever it might be. Um, um, to, you know, um, uh, you know uh, ways of communicating across Twitter. The Shut Do Manu Island is actually a New Zealand-based initiative that was trying to respond to Australia's policies towards asylum seekers. There's Double the Refugee Quota. That's been a, a fairly influential campaign here in New Zealand. Restoring Family Links, which is through the Red Cross. It looks to connect family across different countries to help them identify them. Some of our participants are on Neighborly. I don't know if any of you are on Neighborly. Some of them have actually used Neighborly to quite powerful ways where they've gone on and said, um, I'm looking for a car seat. And a woman that she didn't know came to her front door within 10 minutes and gave her a car seat. Um, so the ways that social media might be able to, to even sort of bring people together across difference. So that we don't just think about social media as it relates to ethnicity or ethno-national labels, but think about that in terms of age, religion, um, geographic location, other interests, um, you know, thinking about this as an intersectional endeavor. Um, but I'm not arguing for digital utopia. Um, there are as many cautions here as there are possibilities. That the reliability of the information, so if we look at that Ushahidi map, I mean, who's populating that map and is that possibly even done in particular ways? Human traffickers are involved in providing false information around some of this stuff, or, you know, uh, you know how reliable is it? And also to recognize the digital divide, which is you know, frequently used, which sort of really highlights that for many people that these technologies aren't available, accessible, or affordable. Uh, and that for some, you know, they may not have those, those digital literacies. In fact, some people are now arguing that, that digital illiteracy is a new form of poverty. So to, to recognize that this isn't just about digital solutions. Uh, Facebook and uh, Mark Zuckerberg aren't going to save us here. Um, <laughs> And to think about privacy and confidentiality, to think about who's sort of watching our, our conversations. And once we post these things, if we're talking about political life, where do these opinions reside and who has access to them? Um, one of the things that was sort of heralded with Web 1.0 and 2.0 was sort of this idea that it was going to democratize information. But one of the things that, that really starts to come you know, strikingly clear in some of this is that that isn't always the case. Uh, that, you know, if you looked at my Facebook feed, you wouldn't have thought that there was any chance in the world that Donald Trump would have been elected president. But when we think about who's on our social media platforms, platform sociality, the people that we like, we usually like them because they have similar views as us. And so what's sort of happening is that instead of democratizing, sort of increasing the bandwidth, it's actually narrowed it so that, um, you know, in my world, there's no way that Trump was going to be elected president. And yet that wasn't the real world that, that, that eventually. So to think about how the, this, these platform socialities actually in some ways create new challenges to actually sort of having the debates that we need to have across different, across difference and across different groups. I've already sort of mentioned surveillance, but even this digital omnipresence, you know, people's phones never turn off. Some of you have probably had a phone that's been buzzing in your pocket or something like that as, as, as I've been going on. And so how this relates to sort of everyday lives. And of course, that there's the dark side of social media. And uh, there's lots of examples that relate to that around sort of how this has been used for nefarious purposes. And finally, interesting, so this, this notion of slacktivism, so that you can go onto a vase, for instance, and sign a petition to sort of say, I'm against this, but does that actually possibly um, dilute and reduce what might be considered real social action or activism? Because I've done my bit by clicking on this link and saying I disagree, does that actually sort of reduce the power of some other social initiatives. So ultimately, you know, if we just come back to, um, um, you know, this map again, it is thinking about the affordability, the, the usability, the availability of these technologies and connecting people both proximate and distant. 
But I think that's it's really thinking about sort of how we shape these associated social, civic, digital, and transnational spaces matters. How we do that here in relation to there. And to think about the ways that people can be, you know, the differences between presence and participation within those spaces and the difference between an invite and a welcome for refugees. And that we sort of think about that settlement space as intersectional, as everyday, as transnational, and also as digital. And just finally, as a bit of a shameless plug, um, this, this is my book that was just published last week, um, which is entitled Belonging and Transnational Refugee Settlement, um, Unsettling the Everyday and the Extraordinary. Um, so I can tell you more about that at some point if you like. Um, but I'd just like to thank you for your time and um, certainly feel free to be in touch. Fiona. <laughs> Stop sharing. Yeah, let's stop sharing. Stop sharing. Right. Sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing with you all. Okay, great. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Dave. It's a uh, yeah, uh, fascinating talk and really insightful, and uh, there's lots to think about. I think, and that relate not just to the questions that you're specifically addressing in your research around the lives of everybody, but actually more broadly. Quite a, quite a question set. Um, so I, I think we've got some time, maybe about 10 minutes for, for questions and discussion until people have to head off elsewhere. So um, invite people either here in Auckland or elsewhere to sort of uh, raise your hand or jump in um, with, um, with questions for Jay. I'm fine. <laughs> I might start off then in the absence of someone okay. jumping hand up. <laughs> um, uh, you, you mentioned at the outset um, uh, that you sort of framed this in terms of thinking about um, transnationalism and talking about borders not being quite as powerful. I, I wonder to what extent um, that is, it, you might want to think about the ways in which the, the, the structures you were talking about in terms of social media, the ways in which certain people are connected more to, to some groups than others are actually not about borders becoming less powerful, but about borders being reconfigured. Um, so if, for example, if we recognize that nations and ethno-national groups are, are formed, yes, in territorial places, but also transnationally, um, then they must also be formed socially in both of those places too. Um, so it, it seems to me thinking about borders is something that doesn't just end once we say people are in two different places, actually we need to think about how they're reconfigured. And it might also raise questions, and you know, there's not the scope to see this in the material you presented here, but it might raise questions about how nation states themselves also reconfigure their practices in relation to um, social media. That might be an engagement with diasporas at the more benign end, um, or it might be involvement in the kinds of surveillance that you talk about. So I'm, I guess I'm raising a uh, yeah, a, a question about how much we can actually say that this sets the borders are not quite as powerful. And if you want to say that transnational space matters, well, then surely the bordering of that space matters as much, but a different kind of border. Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's that, that's um, that's a great comment, uh, Francis. I mean, I guess what I was trying to, to emphasize there was that I think borders, as uh, traditionally envisaged, and, and that way people are actually able to to transcend those in ways that they may not have been able to. Previously, so in that sense, it was not as powerful. But absolutely, um, uh, this border does reconfigured, um, both in terms of uh, people's own experiences, but I also think that the state, like the New Zealand government, has been has spoken to me about some of this, and even thinking about sort of the ways that they sort of um, uh, 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 possibly resource infrastructure and um, and and sites of displacement, so that people are able to connect. Uh, the ways in which um, even um, you think about Australia, the way that they've sort of externalized their borders in particular way, and even um, transgressed international obligations that they had to, to do those things, the way that so those borders um, are shifted in those ways. I mean, absolutely. I think it's a great point. I have a question. Maddie. Yes. Yep. Um, I was really fascinated by your observation in terms of how people are pretty immersed digitally and its implications for integrating in everyday life over here in the country that they're resettling themselves in. And I wonder if you had any observations in terms of uh, age or cohort in terms of being a digital native or digital migrant. Yeah, and how, yeah, that's correct. You know, young people might connect locally with other young people 
because they share uh, in terms of content that they may like, uh, etc. You know, yeah. Like um, you know, it was, it was really interesting when I started this study that I, I had the assumption that some, so I have participants that are as young as sort of like um, in their early 20s to some participants that are in their late 50s. Um, and I had assumption that the younger people were going to be far more engaged in that way, but it, that actually hasn't turned out to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and that for some of them, actually, for the younger participants, I think that they probably have some of them have have um, more engaged maybe everyday lives within New Zealand, mm -hmm. and so that the that social media space for some of the older participants is really important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that was been interesting is that for, even for some of the younger participants, I've also asked them to speak about. That when if they traveled as a family or if their family came over, you know who taught them about social media? Did they teach others about social media? And a lot of them introduced their their parents to social media, and they spoke it about. You know, I think about one participant in Christchurch, for instance, who speaks about how um, their parents were quite isolated, and then they showed them Skype and WhatsApp, and basically said they're completely different people now. They're they're engaged, and they also feel better about their lives within Christ. Um, so, you know, even that thing around sort of digital literacies, I mean, the way that some of these platforms work, I mean, you know, Skype or WhatsApp, you don't even have to be able to read. You, there's just a few little buttons that you just click and, and, you're, and you're connected. Um, so, um, uh, I mean, I think there probably are some age cohort thing going on, but I was actually really surprised at, at um, even people who didn't grow up with these things, the, the non-digital natives, you know, that, that term. Um, are actually using this in, in very powerful ways. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, go with Jess. Hi, Jess. Oh, okay. Hi. Sorry, Trudy, I can't actually see you. Um, thanks, Jay. That was uh, really interesting. I just want to actually uh, jump on to those differences because you're obviously talking specifically about refugees and and i think you're absolutely right i remember when i was in berlin in 2015 during the refugee crisis and the donations were flooding and you might have seen that in france as well yeah. i think one of the single most important items that was always called for apart from clothes was uh, mobile phones and sim cards um so i think that speaks to your point of um the importance of connectivity in everyday life and so forth but i was wondering in how far you see a difference or in, to what extent you see a difference between refugees and other kinds of migrants mm -hmm. and that possibility of rethinking settlement in terms of transnationalism because i think we're probably by now maybe a little bit more advanced <laughs> of uh accepting transnationalism in migrant settlement but i'm not sure how this what this looks like in terms of refugees yeah um i mean uh so when you say we you mean we as 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 like um um, uh, nations, but nations. so in that state-centric view that you spoke to. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'd say in many ways that there's, there are more similarities and differences. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about around, oh, uh, you know, they're on social media two or three hours a day. I mean, that's nothing actually sensational to claim. I mean, I think that that actually relates to, to, to everyday people um, uh, with, within, within New Zealand. Um, I think probably, some of the some of the key differences between refugees and migrants um, are that is, is one just around sort of that that safety and security uh, aspect um, and so for some for some participants uh, even even engaging with their networks could possibly put put them at, at put them with their families at risk um, for other ones uh, it's 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 not just about sort of reconnecting it's actually about knowing that they're safe uh, that, that, that they're still alive, and so in, the, in, the, in those in, in those respects, I think that, that that goes beyond what might be you know what you might sort of just group as maybe say I guess maybe a voluntary migrant, for instance. Recognizing that this sort of this voluntary forced migration isn't isn't a binary; it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wide spectrum of experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, I think that. Um, the, 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 the other main difference from a state focus is that is that is that you know the, the migrant debate is largely around that migrants choose to come here whereas refugees don't really get to choose they're sort of selected at least in terms of refugee resettlement and so I think that it becomes that, that, there, that there that there is this I mean it, the burden is there for everyone but I think particularly for refugees 
the, the ways that refugees are positioned are, you know, they're an economic burden to our society, they're a cost, and they need to contribute and, and give back as quickly as possible. I mean, really, if you look at the refugee resettlement strategy, whilst employment isn't one of the explicit five arms, I mean, it's kind of built within everything, right? And I mean, I think that there's opportunities and there's justifications in that, but it also sort of reinforces that economic fundamentalism. And so if we think about its relation to social media, if people are engaging in that, and, and, and the idea is, well, they're not integrating into everyday life, then, you know, it might just be problematic in some ways. The other thing is that I presented something similar to this at, 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 at uh, an asylum forum uh, a few months ago. It's a government asylum forum. And some of the responses from officials were things like, oh, I'd never thought that, um, that talking with family might be problematic. And almost as a way of trying to think through that, you know, maybe family reunification, maybe we shouldn't, you know, you know, so one, you know, should we be looking to reduce that? But then another comment was, oh, well, if they can have these intimate connections, maybe we don't have to worry about family reunification. They can just connect on Skype and that's nice and free and that's, that's an affordable policy decision, right? That's great research. So you have to be really careful around what conclusions people make from the study and, and, and where they take it because they will, I think they will try to take sort of you know, the directions they're wanting to go or the key performance indicators that they have to deliver on and, and use those to, to justify certain conclusions. So I think that in, in, in that respect, my, my very long-winded response to you, Jess, is I think that there's probably more similarities and differences, but I think there are some key differences in terms of how they're received and perceived by the receiving society, the different sort of policies that relate to them coming as refugees, that I think do have some implications for the ways in which um, they experience settlement as an experience of belonging. Mm. Thanks. Martha. Jay, I just wondered, oh, after, oh, sorry, Shimina, but um, uh, I just wondered if you could uh, tell us about um, the technicalities of gaining consent from your participants, because I'm thinking more and more of how to talk uh, I mean, you know, I don't have a cell phone, uh, smartphone, but I imagine that you're doing a lot through your smartphone. But um, I'm thinking more and more of how, how to do faster research and therefore um, what it means by the, all those other processes we have to do of collecting consent forms. And um, uh, I recently just had a book publisher say to me, I have to send a permission, a permission form for an interview to every person who I interviewed, even though I can collected consent forms. And I just wonder if these how you manage that? Uh, <laughs> um, that's probably a conversation that will take more than um, 10 minutes, Martha. Uh, it's, 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 it's been really difficult um, in a number of ways. It required a lot, of, a lot of thinking and I've actually had to go back and change a few things as I've gone along. Um, but just, I mean, quickly really, I mean, um, making sure that participants are safe, that the transnational networks are safe is, 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 is actually the first thing that, that's, that, that's critical within that. Um, uh, an interesting thing that I found methodologically is I actually, within this grant, I actually had quite a bit of travel that I had allocated for me to travel to these places across New Zealand. So I had participants in Palmerston North, Nelson, uh, Wellington, Auckland, Christchurch, um, is that I'd have to travel and meet with these people, that they would need to see me face to face. I mean, all the research that I've done has been so relational. I just, you know, to get some of those deeper insights, I thought that they needed to know me. But because these people are so involved in that digital space, with a few exceptions, I mean, a lot of my participants, I, have, I haven't met face to face ever. Um, and I may not ever meet them, I don't know. Um, and actually, we've I would say we've developed quite trusting relationships in that. And so, um, it's been fascinating from a methodological standpoint that to be able to conduct interviews on Skype or WhatsApp, um, and you know, there's other additional ethical considerations around that. You know, who's in the room? What questions are you asking? Um, all, all, all those sorts of things. Um, there's a lot more that I could talk to you about the ethics of it, um, and um, even where I'm going with the study. But I think uh, maybe let's just leave it there, and I can talk to you further about that as, as we go along. Maybe that can be the next ESOC side. Shimano. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thanks for your talk, Jay. It was really fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, so your talk talked a lot about how um, refugees uh, use social media to, I guess, connect the here and the there, so to forge connections with their home countries and or the people globally, right? So I was just wondering if there were any instances of uh, your participants using social media to establish connections or forge links to New Zealand. Now, I know you mentioned that uh, example of the car seat or something like that. Were there more e examples of that or did your participants just mainly use media to forge links um, back, you know, yeah. back to their home countries. Um, I mean, this is where probably um, even coming back to one of Maddie's comments around sort of an age cohort dynamic, because I actually did find that for some of the younger participants, they are using social media locally more than the older ones. Um, but there were some exceptions to that, and so, but it seemed like the younger ones are using social media with a wider group of, of, of people, and so on, on, on the questionnaire I asked, I, I said, I asked them, can you tell me a little bit about your networks transnationally and within New Zealand? Mm -hmm. And what you can actually see is that um, for the younger ones, it seems that ethnicity isn't as, as an important of a marker, even for some of them. You, most of their local networks aren't actually from the ethnic groups. <laughs> transnationally, they are, oftentimes they are. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, um, just lost my train of thought. Um, also, so forging links, and so, um, so for some of the participants within the local space, they might have like a, like there, there's a WhatsApp group which are called like the Muslim Sisters or something like that, in which uh, there's about sort of I think about 400 women across New Zealand that 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 are a part of it, and that there's sort of a daily interaction, and they can you know there's an example that I've got my data around sort of how do I source a burkini and when is the pool open and sort of talking about you know those sorts of things which is obviously sort of talking with women not necessarily from the ethnic group but from at least from a, you know that they're, they're, they're all they're all um, they're all Muslim women um, but then there, there are other groups that are on things like neighborly um, where it's about sort of geographic location that allows you to, to engage and a lot of them have done that really good interestingly some of them actually use trade me as a way of connecting with other people and that by buying things and bartering and talking with them they forge friendships that way. Oh, wow. So even thinking about trading me as a social media site is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then for some of the younger ones, they often use Facebook. And it seems to, that, that their educational experiences going to high school, university, really sort of create a broader network through which they sort of engage and, and have interactions with people. So, so there are certainly lots of local links in relation to that. As I'm trying to wind up the study, I'm going to, to, to increasingly focus on this everyday New Zealand life and trying to understand its intersections with transnational connections. Wow, thank you. Yeah, that sounds really interesting because I would assume that would hold, uh, have implications for this whole notion of settlement and the sense of belonging in terms of forging links, yes, between the here and there, but also in the everyday lives now here in New Zealand as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Any other questions, <laughs> topics people would like to discuss? That was pretty. <laughs> no, my question's actually been, Shimana just kind of nailed it really. He was, it was speaking to the same idea around, yeah, moving beyond transnationalism yeah. and thinking about local community. And, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I've actually presented some of this work in several schools that have students from refugee backgrounds, and they've got Wi-Fi there, and it's been really interesting seeing the ways that they, talking to some of the staff around how students from refugee backgrounds are using this one to sort of connect to friends, but also um, the ways in which they're receiving messages um, transnationally, and sometimes some quite disturbing messages and, and images. And it's really sort of interesting or sort of around sort of this idea of, of well-being and how important that is, but also how do we respond to these, you know, when you know, a horrific image comes through or someone receives a WhatsApp message saying, I'm in trouble, you know, there's, you know, and, you know, you could say, oh, well, we just shut them out of that, but those are also important messages. So it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's this new settlement space that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. really, really challenging.
but there's also opportunities in it as well. I just um, add as you, as you talk, I don't know if I have a question in here, but I'm reflecting on uh, a master's student from Palmerston North, um, Jessica Halley. She conducted some research with Bhutanese refugees, uh, a young, young family, all sisters, and it didn't start out that way, but it became evident that they were using social media platforms constantly to intentionally construct what they, a, sort of a Kiwi, in inverted commas, identity. Right. And their mum was very, um, very much in favour of them lo truly locating themselves here in New Zealand um, and, and just sort of contesting the place from which they had come. It sort of speaks to a very different idea, I guess, um, mm from what you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm just kind of interested in this kind of using, using technology to intentionally construct an identity and how that kind of plays out over time, I suppose. To what extent, it, oh, I'm not quite sure what my question is, but it's just an interesting aside to the sort of work that you've been doing. That's great. Mm. Mm. It works really, really lovely actually. It's a yeah. beautiful piece of work. Cool. Right. Jessica, but it's, an, it's definitely an, an, the intersection of um, ethnic identity and gender, you know, their, their performance of gender in, on social media platforms was a key focus of how they kind of position mm -hmm. themselves. On that note, um, I guess we'll, um, we'll wrap things up for this morning, but Dan, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that in uh, three weeks, I, I'm certainly right, um, yeah, and Jessica's nodding, that's good, um, <laughs> we'll be giving a, uh, another talk within this, uh, the Migration Research Network. Um, I, we don't have a confirmed topic, but Kate's expertise obviously are in the realm of uh, citizenship in particular, but I know she has also done some work around uh, in Southeast Asia around um, issues too. So, um, so we'll once we get a topic for that, we'll confirm it and send the advertisement out. And hope to see uh, many of you again then, or uh, as well as others. Thank you very, very much, everyone, for tuning in. And thanks, Dave, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.